Welcome back to Division One Rejects. It's officially the playoffs. I think I said that last week, but now it's like officially official. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. Tonight we got the playoff round one recap from D2, D3, and NAIA football. I'm joined by the usual suspects. Jimmy Martin joins me to break down the D3 games. Matt Schwarzler coming in in the nightcap to talk about NAIA football. You're stuck with me for the D2 football side of things. There's so much great football tonight, and you get it a day early. You're seeing this on Monday as I release this one, so you're welcome for that. Otherwise, though, maybe you're not here for me. Maybe you're here to hear from Terrell Davis, the stud wide receiver down there at the University of Central Oklahoma. They had overtime thriller against Washtaw Baptist down there in Super Region number 3. Or how about Ryan Blair, the quarterback from Whitworth University. The Pirates picked up a big win over Pomona Pitzer, and now they're taking on the ever-daunting North Central Cardinals. Two great guests, and I thoroughly enjoyed having both those guys on the show. But, I mean, that is really the gist of it tonight. We've got some great playoff football to talk about, and I don't really want to waste too much more of your time. I want to get right into this. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Video chapters, bottom of the episode. Fast forward to any part of the conversation, any game that you want to see, fast forward right to it, hear about our recap and our analysis. Otherwise, follow us on the socials, Twitter at D1 underscore rejects, Instagram, Division One rejects, to see highlights from the show. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's get right into that first guest conversation with Terrell Davis. Joining the show tonight, the man who is breaking records, finishing drives in Central Oklahoma. We talked to his quarterback earlier in the year. This time, though, it's wide receiver on the outside for the Broncos. Troy Davis, what's going on, man? What's up? Thank you for having me on here, man. Dude, excited to get you on here after the year that you're having. I, th I think I say this to a lot of guys, but it really mean it with you. It would be a disservice to not get you on the show and talk about the season you guys are having on down down there. And um, after this weekend or yesterday as we're recording this on, on Sunday night, just another piece, it feels like, this team of firsts. Is that kind of the vibe down there? Yeah, it is, man. It's exciting just going through this with, with your guys that you know you built up for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're all excited, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Absolutely. And now with you, of course, we'll talk about your team a bunch, and you can deflect as much as you want, but I'm going to talk about you. 14 catches, 155 yards, some big plays on that last drive. And I think there's a level of, um, you know, having a big performance and also balancing the fact that, you know, that with you guys score a lot of points, that was kind of the odd occurrence where you're not the one in the end zone, you know, getting your hands on the ball on, on a lot of these drives. But you were such a big piece in getting you guys down the field. One of those last possessions, I think what sticks with me is you're coming across the middle and that ball bounces off your hands. Right. Mm -hmm. And to see that reaction immediately, like a man, like in the moment, you're like, man, I'm gonna let my guys down. But you kind of squash that doubt immediately. And guess what happens? They come right back to you. Talk about that kind of roller coaster of emotions and, and being able to step back up and make a play when they needed it. Man, it was uh, it's rare that I drop something like that. So I just knew that if we came back to it, it would, it would work. So and my coach is trusting me, my quarterback trusting me. So they came right back to me and I, I made the play the next the next time that you did and, and you make it sound pretty easy it is not right to bounce back from a from a play like that and from one at a, at a very critical time in the game right where you know if, if things turn out differently that's something where people are going to go back and look at and I'm sure you're probably your biggest critic over there going back and evaluating your own film but uh yeah. that's a that's a really awesome deal and now in those moments that for example driving down the field trying to to even this thing up or take the lead against a talented Wachita Baptist team, excuse me. I imagine you got to want to have the ball in your hands in those moments. I'm sure that's your mindset going into those kind of drives. Yes, I always – I know my teammates uh, hear it a lot. I always want the ball. So, uh, I know it's just uh, – I'm just glad that I could uh, help the team out, you know. And I'm glad that my quarterback, you know, Jet, he always going to trust in me. So, I know he's going to try to get it there every time. So, I'm just uh, – yeah, I'm glad to have have helped on that last drive. Yeah, you guys are dangerous together, absolutely, in the you know, definition of the word. And, you know, you talk about this team, the first playoff appearance in 21 years for this squad, the first win in 25, it feels like, I kind of mentioned it earlier, you're on a team of firsts. What is it like being around this kind of experience right now and how many eyes and kind of more attention, whether that's local community or people like me on the national stage that come across and are covering this team more? What's that experience been like kind of leading the charge? You and others, of course, leading the charge for this Bronco attack and, and being this team of firsts. Man, it's awesome. The uh, Edmond community, they love us. Like, they've been uh, good supporters, but I definitely feel it more this year. Mm -hmm. You know, it always takes to win to have people come support, especially when you have OSU and OU 
right up the street. So yep, I'm, it's it's fun this year, man. We have a lot of fans. We have a lot of alumni coming back and uh, just supporting us. You know, getting us whatever we need. If we need something, they'll help us out. And just nationally, man, it's it's great to have people talk about you from places that have never probably been to Oklahoma. So, right. you know, it's it's awesome. I know my guys are excited. We're all excited. It's it's new to all of us, but we're all taking it in and just enjoying it. So I love that about our team. Yeah, you got to balance that with, you know, if you don't enjoy the moment and you're so locked in on, on the next practice, the next game, and this and that, then you, you're not going to be able to get that back. There's a balance, right? I think that's... Excuse me, I think that's really important. Now, um, those waterfalls, the addition to that, the spot down there, I don't know if it's this weekend, a regional final, whatever it would take, we need someone, I mean, just shower in the falls after a big-time win like that. I mean, that's got to happen at some point. Man, I know. We we talk about it a lot, like we're going to go get in the waterfall. But after the game, it's more of just wanting to spend time with the team than uh, actually doing it. But, no, it's definitely talked about a lot, man. We – we always say, like, after we do this, we're going to go jump in the waterfall. But nobody <laughs> does that yet, so. the, the question is, is whether it will be one of you guys or whether uh, someone have a few too many pops and, and run over there and, and make it happen first. So that's a fan Man. or some kind of – yeah, you know what I mean? And they're going to have to That'd drag awesome, somebody bro. out of there. <laughs> That'd be awesome if a fan did. Yeah, dude. I don't. I don't want to be the, the the security guy dragging a a full grown man just soaking wet <laughs> out of a out of a waterfall to football stadium. Um, probably beer still in hand, but yeah. um, all jokes aside, that is a a funny but like really unique piece that has just helped yeah. create that kind of game day atmosphere. And that along with a, a newly renovated and upgraded video board, right? It feels like the program has really been put into and bought into by this university is that kind of the general yeah. consensus they've been able to yes make the upgrades when it comes to facilities but also really investing in you guys as people yeah yes it's uh we we appreciate it so much like just having things that we know in a lot of other d2s don't so uh, we have the waterfall we have a very nice facility nice weight room and mm -hmm. uh we know a lot of people um help put this together and we as players, we do our part just around the community, trying to, you know, show show our faces and just whatever they ask of us, we we try to do. Last time I double A squad standing, brother. That's got to be, uh, you know, kind of a badge of honor right there. That's a really neat deal. Now, talking about, you know, back to Saturday here. Jet gets to start for you guys yesterday after not playing against Emporia. Are there any challenges on your end? Kind of, obviously, two talented guys under center that have been going back and forth for you. But are there any challenges from a receiver standpoint of adjusting to that and trying to, you know, game plan? Are there some differences between, you know, who's getting you the rock? Uh, honestly, no, they're both. Like you said, a very good quarterback. So I, I've had uh, last year with Dawson, you know, so we have a lot of yep um, chemistry. And then I've had this year with Jet. So the chemistry is there on both sides. And, you know, whichever one of them play, they, I, I got faith in them. Everybody on the uh, sideline has faith in them. So, you know, whichever one plays, that's the one that everybody's going to back. So, yeah, I have, that can I, be they're both good. That can be a powerful thing. It can also be a dividing piece, right? When you talk about um, guys at a position that is so key, like the quarterback position, you can sometimes have, and I've seen it, you have guys that maybe align or side with one of the two guys, right? And that can be a really big divider for teams where you have almost these sections or these clicks in the team that are now almost actively rooting against one another, which is really unhealthy. Yeah. And that happens, um, you know, at the college level, the uh, the professional level, even you talk about guys endorsing others. So I'm glad to hear that, um, you know, not really the case down there. But talk about yeah. the pacing of that game. You guys had to lead almost the entirety of this one until late in the fourth. Offense was clicking when it seemed like it mattered, but things – you never took your foot off the gas, but things certainly seemed to get dialed up there when they took the lead about, what, three minutes left in that fourth quarter? Yeah, it was – um, I just know we were, we were built for those moments. Like, I was telling the guys on the sideline, like, we'd been here before. Like, we had a, a overtime or, you know, down to the wire game uh, those last two out of three games of the season. So, mm -hmm. um, I was telling everybody, like, we are built for this and no need – like, nobody was panicked on the sideline because, you know, like – I feel like God has put us through some things, so we we was built for that exact moment, and everybody came through. Nobody folded. Nobody uh, took uh, playoff, and we all came together as one. And that's on all sides of the ball. I mean, talk about the defensive effort from you guys. Seven sacks, 12 total tackles behind the line of scrimmage, dude, for that defense. What would you see from that side of the ball? 
Man, I know our defense get a lot of hate, but <laughs> not gonna lie, they they do a lot for us offensively, man. We appreciate them all the time. We make sure they know that and practice is so competitive with them. And we just I love going against them every day. Like in my eyes, that's the best defense. So I'm gonna rock with those guys all all the time. I love it, dude. And they stepped up for you guys when you needed it. And you guys do the same, right? It's that's what you call complimentary football. You guys have done a lot of that over the course of this year. But now the tall task ahead. You make the almost 1,000-mile trip to Big Rapids, Michigan. I really hope you guys are stepping foot on a plane and that is not a bus trip, I would imagine. Yes. Uh, we're okay. Flying over. <laughs> okay, man. Hey, at this level, man, I have seen crazier things. I'm glad I'm to not. hear that. They're taking care of you boys down there. You need it. You deserve it. But uh, still early on in terms of prep, but what do you know about this Ferris State squad and that defense particularly that you need to be aware of? Uh, I know they have a, a very good defense. They're a very good team all around. So, um, you know, over this week, we're going to prepare just like we prepare for anybody else. Um, it is playoffs, so we know everybody's going to be oh, good yeah. at the day. So, you know, we just preparing like um, like we're going against the number one team in the nation, which they are. So I'm excited for it. I know everybody's on the team excited for it. I would say at this level, I mean, you said it. Everyone at this point is really damn good. Like, there's no getting around that. There's 16 teams left out of, like, 130 or whatever the hell the number is. And I think a big selling point, and you kind of alluded to it there, is the guys at this level, like you, and I'm not sure if you have any aspirations of playing beyond college and as far as professionally, and I feel like these are kind of marquee games for you. And maybe you don't circle them on the calendar, but certainly it's like, hey, I want to go and – Obviously, the team comes first, the win. I'm not trying to put that aside. But from a personal standpoint, like, I'm trying to go get some film against some guys that are really damn good players. And if we can go out and get the win and I can perform well for my team while also, you know, kind of setting myself up for success when it comes to after college, I feel like these are the kind of games that you, you kind of really mark on the calendar. Am I, am I hitting the mark there? Yeah, it is. You know, it's always good to play against. Uh, competition, but just playing in the MIAA in general is always a competition each week. Thanks. But you know, going against the number one team in the nation, that's you can't ask for more of a challenge than that. So yeah, it would be it would be nice to go perform. Absolutely. You're going to do that, but obviously team comes first. You guys have been a collective effort down there. I'm excited yeah. to, to tune into UCL and Ferris weekend, man. It's going to be that is going to be an awesome contest. Excited for you boys. Yeah. But that's all I got for you, Troy. I appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. Have a good rest of your night. All right, big thank you to Terrell for coming on the show. And now we have a metric ton of Division II football to talk about. 12 games. I am going to try and cover every single one of them. Some will be more in-depth than others. That's for a variety of reasons. For example, let's start things off. Carson Newman at Miles. This game, a very highly anticipated matchup. And unfortunately... I wish I could have watched the first half. The broadcast difficulties for the first game of the day on ESPN Plus, not a great look. And understandably so, I want to make sure that everyone knows ESPN Plus takes the feed from these smaller schools, right? So obviously, you know, the host site here being Miles, they're having some type of technical difficulty on their end. And I know everyone loves to throw shade at ESPN because I do too. I mean, get your shit together, ESPN. But um, a lot of this unfortunately falls on, on Miles and their inability to get that broadcast up. Very frustrating from the standpoint of obviously paying for this broadcast, and I just wanted to watch what ended up being a very quality football game. We got some some clips here, a couple of them. I will not be able to show clips from the actual live stream of the game due to like monetization purposes, and I want to be able to monetize the videos. So sorry about that, but I do have highlights from just about every game that we'll be able to review and watch as we go on. But let's talk about Carson Newman coming out of the sack into the playoffs, a team that has a lot of historical success at the D2 level and now kind of trying to get back to that level under head coach Ashley Ingram and coming into a Miles team that I think is surprised a lot of people this year, myself included. I was not hip to this Miles squad, this Golden Bear squad, that um, really has made a lot of noise inside of the regular season. And you look at this game, Miles opened things up first, 7 nothing in the first quarter. In the second, though, is when the majority of the scoring happened. And we went into halftime, Miles still with a, a, a one score, or sorry, excuse me, a four-point lead. And that's almost where things would end up. Carson Newman hits a field goal in the fourth quarter to make things a little bit more interesting at 14-13. to 13, Kind of a questionable decision. Only a 29-yard field goal, which is really odd. But, you know, this is the second touchdown of the day for that Golden Bears squad. We'll take a look at it right here. Coming around the edge, right into the end zone. That 
is Gennaro Scott in the five-yard touchdown run that would put the Golden Bears up 14-7, to had them feeling good in this one. Looks like a really neat environment down there, too. I certainly have not been on campus there, but I like to set up some of those old-school buildings up behind the bleachers, the, the bowl kind of inset there. Really like the, uh, the atmosphere and what I've seen, at least from some of the clips. And... Um, from there, I talk about it. Miles goes on to win this one 14 to 13. Had a great clip of the celebration from the Golden Bears after this one. And their first playoff win ever for this Miles team. That is certainly reason enough to celebrate. Check it out right here. They take a knee to close things off. And the scene there was pretty awesome. And uh, kudos to them for not going like. Ballistic. I think a lot of teams, when they pick up kind of those first historic type wins, uh, they overshadow maybe and kind of um, do, really do some over-the-top celebration. They certainly earned the right to celebrate, but obviously handle your business at midfield, go through all the regular game day type stuff, and then you get to wear a smile like that if you're part of that Golden Bears team or that fandom because a very big-time historic win for this team. And they certainly are going to have it cut out for them. You know, a tough task in Valdosta State next week. But... For the time being, how about just enjoy this one? Check out the press box right there. Like I said, this is a really neat-looking stadium. But to talk about this game, more particularly on the stat side of things, for Miles, I think you look at this 14-13 right there, the final that um, you see, obviously, and you could probably make this assumption, but not a whole lot of offense for this uh, Golden Bears team. And um, I think the defense stepped up for both sides, but when you had... 20 or 31 rushes, excuse me, on the day for this mile squad and finishing with 69 net yards combined with only 84 through the air. You're talking about a team at the Division II level that just won a playoff game with 153 yards of total offense. And again, that's not a shot at miles. I think if anything, it is kind of a testament to the fact that they're able to come and win a game where their offense has struggled to a major degree. Carson Newman outgained them by a factor of 2-1, to one, 305 yards to 153. Not exactly 2-1, to one, but pretty damn close, right? Carson Newman had the better time possession. They had much more yardage on the ground, 179 to 69 of miles, 15 first downs to 10 of the Golden Bears. There was a lot of metrics that were going their way. Miles punted the ball eight times in this one. But at the end of the day, what happened is this team was able to punch in touchdowns when they needed to. And Carson Newman ultimately settled for a few field goals that ended up being very critical in a matchup like this, right? Um, the one interception for Carson Newman, too, I don't think Miles was really able to generate. I'm trying to see turnover wise. There were one fumble on each side, like nothing too ridiculous there. No outrageous or egregious penalties. I just think this is a classic case of Carson Newman being able to drive down the field and sustain these drives, but are unable to finish them with six, seven points, right? So kudos to Miles' defense. They are kind of a bend, not break type mentality, I guess, in this one where they allow the, field, the team to go down the field. But when it got into that red zone area, man, things got bad quick for that Eagles offense. Let's move forward. This might be the most ridiculous matchup of the playoffs that I have ever seen. And admittedly, I've not been watching the playoffs for 10, 15, 20 years. This game was absurd. Harding, the defending national champions, the Bison, they go into the jungle at Pittsburgh State, and they handled business. They stood on business, they handled business, and they went about their business. The Bisons. 48-3 to three over a Pittsburgh State team that I have talked incredibly and speak incredibly high of because they have deserved it. The Gorillas are one of the premier programs in Division II football, and for them to be embarrassed like this on their home field was not on the bingo card for anyone. For anyone. I thought this was going to be such a great game that it didn't deserve to be in the first round of the playoffs, and I still believe Pittsburgh State is one of those top-level, elite-type programs. Uh, footage and highlights here, courtesy of KOAM, and uh, as I roll some of this and talk about this game, because I, I certainly have some thoughts on it, right? We open things up here with a field goal, and Pittsburgh State, that's the opening drive. Three points against a tough Harding defense, and uh, then they go and do this. A big-time interception. This defense continuing to step up against Harding. Dela Cruz coughs up the ball in the ensuing series. He's ruled down by the officials. Pitt State challenges it. They win. Gorilla's ball. Um, and there are a lot of things going really well for Pittsburgh State at the beginning of this. And I actually want to pause uh, some of the highlights to talk about this game because it's going to get too far ahead before I can really talk about it. So Pittsburgh State, 
feels like they have some momentum early on. And the offense was not really doing its thing. But when you talk about being able to generate multiple turnovers defensively, you go down and you score a field goal in your first series. Right? Dela Cruz busts off like a 20, 30 yard run and coughs up the ball at the end of it. They challenge that. They get the ball back. I also love the fact that the Gorillas took a downfield shot right after that. It didn't complete it, but I love the idea of trying to go and make a big kind of swing momentum play. Now, Harding defense, they step up after the turnover. If Pittsburgh State scores after that fumble, they make it a 10 0 game, right? And if you're Harding, running the flex bone, triple option, these are all ifs, people. Like, give me a break here. I have to. It, that's a game, that's a recipe for Harding. They do not like to be in that situation, trying to play from behind with that offense. Against the Pittsburgh State defense, we've seen had a lot of great success up until this point. Right? So for me, that was the critical part of this game. Pittsburgh State, the Gorillas' inability to score and capitalize off that fumble. No field goal, no touchdown, no type of scoring there. That would have been potentially the recipe for disaster for the Bisons. Now Harding, they did a lot. They did a lot of things offensively. They tried to go to the air after successfully running the ball down the field. It was intercepted. Cole Keelan uh, tossed that one up, and unfortunately for him, Pittsburgh State comes down with it. But um, the Bisons, they were kind of having their way with this Pittsburgh State defense as the day wore on. And you had this, this looming feeling as Harding drove down the field in the second quarter that Pittsburgh State had, like I said, missed their opportunity. Here's the, the interception later on from Dodson. And... Harding scores a touchdown on that drive, right? Another Gorillas drive, interception. Harding drives down, touchdown. And then all of a sudden, you're thinking to yourself here, is this game over? And you watch for a couple more minutes, and you're like, holy shit, this game is over. Like, this game has all but been decided. And Harding was absolutely gashing inside, whether it was Dela Cruz, whether it was the outside with Brayden Jay or Spice or some of these guys that are just hitting here, there, everywhere, outside on the jet, the counter, up in the middle on the dive, whether it's Cole Keelan himself taking the thing, and you got, you know, a really good mismatch. By the way, dude does throw dots. I want to make that very clear. That is a dot. They can do that down there. Uh, the boys from Cersei know how to get it done through the air as well. But uh, this Harding team looks absolutely terrifying. It looks like something that uh, you would read a bedtime story to a kid if you never wanted them to sleep at night again. This Harding team is absolutely ridiculous. And now they have a great test. You did it in the jungle. One of the toughest places to play in Division II football. Now you got to go to Lubbers, Grand Valley State. And I'm really excited to talk about that matchup because um, that is one of the more physical games you could possibly play in all of Division II football. We saw it last year, came down to a fourth quarter drive by Harding. Will it be the same kind of theatrics this year? Something tells me maybe. And I guess I can talk about that at a different time. But uh, Harding looked incredibly dominant in that one. And that cannot be overstated. Let's go to one that had much more of a photo finish than Harding and Pittsburgh State. That being Minnesota State going on the road to South Dakota, taking on Augie, Augustana, on their home field. The fourth time these team, two teams have met in the last two years. That's kind of a stat in itself. These highlights, courtesy of our friend uh, Wit, Matt Witwicky over at D2Football.com. Wanted to cut these up and show these because they were great stuff that he captured from the game. You got Augie entering the field, both offenses. Looking pretty lackluster in the first quarter, although Augustana seemed to have the edge on the line of scrimmage. Offensively started to get the ground game going. Now right here, there was a big interception for Mankato, and then a huge sack. They rebound with this play, Trayshawn Watson. Grabs the ball off the Augie defender. That, for me, was the play of the day for this Mankato offense. At the interception, you get sacked, and you rebound with a play like that. Now, Epperson, he left the game in the second quarter. Part of the reason why the Vikings settled for a field goal earlier. He's back here for the touchdown. 16-10 Vikings doing a little dance in the end zone. The dude is absolutely feeling it. Now, here... The onside kick for the Mavs, with a minute 30 left, they recovered the onside kick. At this point, 1917, a minute 30 left in the game, that felt like magic happening. Now, though, game-winning field goal as time expires, 34 yards out for the win. Snap, hold, kick, all good, comes together. Mankato plays spoiler Against Augustana, they storm the field and have a hell of a time over there. This game, I mean, talk about absolutely electric, pretty on-brand NSIC football if you watch this one. Um, just a really fun and exciting game to watch. Not if you were an offensive mind in the first half, I will say. Um, there were some moments there where you're kind of waiting for these teams to figure it out. But uh, 
man, really big time performances. Three interceptions total on the day. Eckern had one for Minnesota State, and then Gunnar Hensley for Augie had two through the air, and and you saw that uh, MSU Mankato, they capitalized on one of those. Now, the rushing attack for Minnesota State was, was not really anything that was – you know, anything to write home about. But Jared Epperson also struggled on the day. I talked about he left in the second quarter. Um, I believe it was some kind of foot injury that he was able to shake off. But 21 carries for 66 yards and that one touchdown, that, that's a pretty meager stat line for him. Uh, wouldn't you say, Buzz? Uh, that's a pretty meager stat line for him uh, at this level of play especially. But... Mankato, that is a, a really statement type of win. They had some guys on defense that certainly stepped up. Uh, Joey Gottel, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, had one pick on the day. And then Richard, Richard A., will say, had the other interception. You had four different guys with TFLs. How about Nathan Drum, Maven Kretschke, a name that we've talked about a lot in that Minnesota State side, both in the backfield registering some sacks for the Mavericks. And a big-time game, a big-time win for that Minnesota State side. Excuse me. Let's move forward. Let's talk Ashland football pulling off what might be the upset of the weekend. The Eagles go into Charleston, a team that just dominated the MEC and coming into the playoffs, had the two seed behind a dominant Kutztown squad. And uh, this one was was a very entertaining game to watch in its entirety. Now, um, these highlights just from Ashland up on Twitter. Go take a peek. But the defense for the Eagles stepped up early. They had a fumble recovery on a strip sack. That was really nice. You see Siobhan Wright getting taken down here. And honestly, in the first part of this game, they really minimized his impact. I was very impressed with this Ashland defense. And um, they had a deep ball touchdown. The broadcast put the points on the wrong side of the scoreboard. I was so confused watching the game. It said Charleston was up 7-0, but I just watched Ashland score the ball, and they kept it up there for a while. Um, the Golden Eagles, they went into wildcat formation on the goal line. They finally punched it in on fourth down. Siobhan Wright had some more physical runs in that second quarter. Felt like he started to establish himself against that defense, and he did end up having a decent day, all things considered. Um, broke a couple long runs, turned the momentum for this Charleston squad. This game was very back and forth. The Ashland pass game got hot as the game went on. And this one, 40-38, to 38, Ashland wins it with a game-winning field goal as time expired. Trevor Bizinski, 28-42, 435 and three touchdowns for the man under center for the Eagles. Siobhan Wright, 42 carries in the day. Talk about an absolute bell cow for this Charleston team. And um, not the end of the season that he or his teammates wanted, but 42 carries for 226 and a touchdown. He certainly still made his impact. And when I tell you, the longest run of the day for him was 18 yards. He was chunk playing these guys. Is in the fact of like not 30, 40 yard gashing type plays. He's going to go get six. He's going to go get eight. He's going to get four. He's going to get five. He was just beating these guys all the way down the field, and um, at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. And kudos to Ashland. If you have a guy like him with his talent level to have 42 carries and he doesn't break one off longer than 18 yards, telltale sign of a very good defense is playing some very sound gap assignment type football. Uh, Tony Panunzio for Ashland, 14 catches, 228, and one touchdown receiving. Very impressive. Very impressive. And now, Ashland plays spoiler. Can they keep it going? We shall see. But that was, for me, that was the upset of the day. I mean, that's a great program kind of defining win for this Ashland squad that you talk about at the beginning of the year for this Ashland team. This team has experienced more ups and downs than most throughout the course of their season. They started the year 0-2. They played, granted, some really quality opponents against uh, IUP and Ferris State to start the year. They went on to win their first five in conference play, six, seven games in conference play. They lose a tough one against Walsh to kind of close out their conference play in the Great Midwest Athletic Conference, still end up winning the conference, close out with a nice win over Kentucky Wesleyan, but it felt like maybe not riding the right momentum into the playoffs. After that tough loss against Walsh, they rebounded in a big way, and now they'll have a great challenge in Cal PA this coming weekend. Now, to close the door on that, really cool statistic on this Ashland team that I certainly wanted to highlight here. Right here, the Ashland football team trailed 21-10 in the third quarter today at Charleston, but won 40-38. It is the first time the Eagles have won an NCAA D2 playoff game when trailing by double digits at any point. Shout out to you, Dusty. Thank you for the stat, brother. That is an awesome stat and a very telling stat of the fight and the grit of this Ashland squad, and I'm excited to watch them continue along the way. Let's keep it moving. 
Back in Super Region number three, Grand Valley State playing host to U Indy, the Greyhounds. Coming into Lubber Stadium, the Black Unis, the Blue Pants for this Grand Valley State squad. I'm going to pull it up here in just a second. Absolute, probably the cleanest look for this GVSU team, I will say. Highlights here courtesy of Fox 17 down there on the west side of Lower Michigan. Let's take a look at the proceedings in this one. Grand Valley, that Laker defense absolutely, absolutely suffocating. This, though, the big-time play, touchdown pass to Kellen Reed in the back of the end zone. The Greyhound defense... I want to give them kudos. They played outstanding. And these two plays right here to Johnson and um, to Reed for these two big, long touchdown plays, that does not tell the story of this game. Grand Valley eventually did wake up. Their offense comes alive. 24-7 final. The Lakers take this one. But this really, this Greyhound attack, they were swarming to the ball early, stuffing the run. I have not seen a team have this much success stifling the Laker rushing attack in a long time. And I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due there because this UND team uh, absolutely deserved it. And um, when you look at the statistics here in the box score, I think that tells more of an overall story here. And that being that Grand Valley was held to... 68 yards rushing on the day. I don't know when the last time that happened was. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. You know, it feels like it's been a while, and um, they passed the ball pretty efficiently, and they're passing their defensive secondary for Grand Valley. Stepped up to the plate under 100 yards for this suck-up and this offense. Uh, Suk-up, I'm hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, the quarterback for UND. But uh, early on in this game, I think one of the, the kind of the big swing points, this game, it was 7 nothing going into halftime. It certainly felt like it could have been 21 nothing. Grand Valley. They were determining the pace of play. Their offense wasn't really sustaining drives, but their defense was absolutely suffocating. And um, the Indianapolis quarterback, he had a shovel pass right into the hands of Jimmy Downs for Grand Valley. He drops it. It would have been an interception on like the five-yard line. That felt like a potential swing moment. Now, Grand Valley it didn't come back to bite him in the ass or anything, but that could have been a really big swing play. The Lakers receiver, uh, or they recovered a fumble in the second quarter. That game uh, could have already been 21-0, like I said, but GVSU playing kind of as, we, as we've come to expect. This Lakers squad we've seen throughout the course of the year, they're not going for style points. They certainly have not run the score up on teams. Even a team like Roosevelt, maybe that struggled throughout the course of the year. Um, they didn't really put away teams like Michigan Tech or Davenport these kind of squads, and uh, they're still just going out and finding ways to win. And I think that's kind of the mantra from Wooster and company over there is that, like, you don't get bonus points for winning by 20 or 30. All that matters is you have more on the scoreboard than the other team at the end of the day. Now, the Grey Greyhounds offense, they did find a little bit of life at the end of the first half. First time they had kind of any momentum, it felt like they got stopped. Uh, but an interception... For UND's defense, gave them a great finish to the half, kind of stifled that Grand Valley attack. In the second half, it felt like the air left the building in Allendale. Uh, Sukup runs in the touchdown, and GVSU not really putting up points. It felt like it could have bit them in the ass going forward as a tie ball game. This thing could have gone either way. Lakers woke up. Lakers got some stuff done. That defensive front from Grand Valley, the defensive secondary, both stepped up. I mean, in big ways. Look at defensively. Who had some of those performances for GVSU? Go down the list. Anthony Cardamone, Jimmy Downs, Jack Grice, uh, Ian Canelli made some big plays in the secondary. Our guy Jack Gilchrist, Niles King. Everyone was out there making plays, forcing fumbles in the backfield. TFL, sack, total just tackles all over the board. Um, it, it was a really impressive overall performance from that Grand Valley State defense. But again, that... Uh, that indie defense, Clay Schultz kind of led them, led the charge there. 13 tackles, three TFLs, and an interception on the day. Schulte, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly. There's a lot of really good things and takeaways. If you're an U indie team that felt like, yeah, you know what, they kind of got disrespected going into the playoffs this year. And I think they earned my respect watching that game. Unfortunately for them, it was not enough to overcome a really talented Grand Valley State squad. Let's move over, though. Let's talk about Wachita Baptist going into central Oklahoma. The Bronchos picking up their first playoff win in 25 years, 38-31. Jet Hoff back under center for this UCO team. He's been back and forth in that room. We talked with uh, Terrell Davis about that earlier on. And for that reason, I won't talk too much about this game. Highlights here courtesy of Oklahoma News 4 as we go through and break down a little bit of this contest down there in Edmond. And uh, long touchdown from UCO right up the gut. I'm sure we'll see it here semi soon. You see the defense here for the Broncos stepping up early on. And excuse me. It felt like there was some pretty poor tackling from that Washtenaw Baptist side. Here comes the uh, 
Touchdown right here up the middle. You see a pretty weak effort from the defensive secondary coming right there. Breaks a couple arm tackles and goes the distance. Kudos, though, right there on the cutback. Wide open. Take that in for the score. And uh, OBU, some trickery. They had a big man touchdown to close out the first quarter. How about these guys? <laughs> that is awesome. But OBU was getting some things done. They had a big man touchdown, uh, kind of a trick play to close out the first quarter. And some good things going for Wachita. Oklahoma, Central Oklahoma, rather, they led this game all the way until about three minutes left in the fourth quarter where OBU actually took their first lead of the game. That was one of the better catches of the day. Holy. Um, but when it mattered, uh, UCO drove down the field, and, and Jethoff really looked in command of this offense. And uh, there's one of the many plays and passes that he completed throughout the course of this one. And it felt like they had a really good grasp on what their offense was capable of. And when they were able to manage some of those time restraint type situations, the team stepped up and, and did just that in some of the bigger moments of the day. And the ground game for UCO, man, I mean, they had themselves a day when it came to running the football. And I think that's something that we haven't seen too much from them. Jalen Cottrell, 17 carries, 151 yards, and two touchdowns for uh, Agent Zero right there up on your screen. Jet Huff finishes 36 of 58 with 371 yards, three touchdowns, did have one interception on the day. And this one, like I said, came down to it. They lose the lead with about three minutes left in the fourth. They regain it with a minute 12 left, but then Dax Jaggers for OBU, a 40-yard field goal with five seconds left in the game, evens it up at 31 apiece, so we're going to overtime. Can't be decided in regulation. Now, in OT, UCO gets the ball, scores like they've been doing all day. Now on to the defense to see if they can make the play. Shout out to Jonathan Godot for the, the video and the clip here. The defense, they did just that down at Edmond. You see here, OBU... Squaring up, trying to make it into the end zone. They need a touchdown to keep the game going. A lot of time, pocket starts to collapse. He goes down, ball comes out, Broncos on top of it, and that is the recipe for success. Actually get coughed up, a Baptist got back on it, but it did not matter. It was over at that point, and that is the first playoff win in 25 years for this Broncos squad. This is a team that has absolutely earned it throughout the entire course of the season. You see the delayed reaction from them, and now they know the game is over. Come out of the field, and that squad has certainly earned it. The last MIAA team standing inside of the Sweet 16 in the Division II playoff. Really an awesome scene. Excited for those guys down there in Edmond. And this was a, a very telling game for UCO. And now, the thing is, are you going to be able to match that level and continue to go against the Ferris State squad that we know is incredibly talented on both sides of the ball? The physicality of Ferris and that defensive front and that front seven is going to be something that I think UCO is going to struggle with greatly. Now, I think the biggest piece, when you watch Jet Huff in that offense, assuming he's back under center for them this weekend, what does their quick game look like? If you're UCO, we saw a lot of here where they'd come across and maybe a little bit longer developing routes, whether it was a deep kind of dig or post corner, some of those type of deals on the outside, these kind of longer developing routes where you need to get guys into the second level of that defensive secondary. What does their quick game look like? What do we have built into the playbook here that we can throw off of a, you know, we need like a hot route or we need someone where we've got someone coming off the edge unaccounted for in our blitz pickup. And I think Ferris is going to dial up that pressure and really not allow them to complete balls 5, 10, 15 yards down the field. So for me, for UCO, how are they going to keep that passing attack alive, get the ball to their playmakers in space in a quick, maybe three-step drop type of quick passing type situation? I think they showed a decent blueprint of that in that two-minute drill they had at the end of the game. Again, Huff looked like he had a great control of that huddle and kind of the pace of play, but I'll be very interested to follow that one as we keep going. But let's move forward. I got to stop and take a breath sometimes. I get too excited talking about these games. Slippery Rock playing host to New Haven. This is a rematch of a regular season matchup we saw earlier in the year. Slippery Rock continues their streak over the Chargers. 14-7. The Rock takes this one. And, uh, you know, for this, a blocked field goal <clears throat> at the start of the second quarter. I had this written down. That felt like a big momentum play for Slippery Rock. I believe they're only up 7-0 at the time. And for them, that could have been a way for New Haven to kind of open the door, so to speak, and help build their confidence as the game continued to go along. Slippery Rock snuffs out any kind of hope that this Chargers offense and kind of attack had. You block a field goal, you play some very complimentary ball, and when you look at this defensive effort from Slippery Rock, 
Uh, 260 yards total offense for this Chargers team is is not what we've come to expect from them, especially only 63 yards on the ground. Now, granted, Slippery Rock struggled on the ground very much as well. There's that blocked field goal. Only 37 yards from the Rock when it came to toting the ball on the ground. And uh, that's kind of surprising. You talk about a guy like uh, Idris Lawrence, the Notre Dame college transfer. He had 13 carries, only finished with 42 yards. That's like an all-region, all-American type talent for Slippery Rock that has been kind of overshadowed this year. Braden Long very much still doing his thing. 21-34, 270, and a touchdown for the Slippery Rock kid over there. Defensively, big-time performances for the Rock. Andrew Vince, 14 tackles on the day. That's big time. Had a couple other guys register some TFLs. Uh, Munchie Johnson, I think, was all over the field. Hell of a name, by the way. Munchie Johnson was all over the field. Um, And this was, uh, again, another statement win for a Slippery Rock squad that, like GVSU, not winning with style points, but really grinding out a gritty type of game and being able to get a result at home. Let's move forward and talk about a very exciting game, that being Virginia Union at Wingate. These highlights I'm about to show here, courtesy of WBTV3. Wingate stunned in the first round. Virginia Union overtime win 34-31. The Panthers take this one. I'll get the film up here after. uh, I'm not going to make you all sit through and watch the ad. But um, the Panthers, this is a huge win for them. And I think they have been doubted. Whether that was because of their recent struggles in the playoffs, the third year the Panthers have made the playoffs, they've been unable to get out of the first round. I think part of that history was certainly part of the reason why they have been doubted coming into this matchup. This Wingate team we've seen play at an incredible clip against some great competition in the SAC throughout the course of the season. I think that was another part of the doubt against Virginia Union is, you know, coming out of the CIAA after that championship performance, it was like, yes, you beat Virginia State. And you had some other good performances throughout the year. How are you going to match up against a team that we know is battle-tested? At their place, they answered the bell, man. They really did. They stepped up to the plate and made some really, really great plays. Um, In this one, it was kind of unfortunate. I will say that uh, I really wish I could have watched more of this. The signal was so intermittent, it wasn't even worth putting on. Because you'd get like 30 seconds of gameplay, and then it would cut out. So I admittedly, I didn't keep this game on for the entirety of it, but uh, a big day for, for HBCUs around. We talked about miles earlier on Virginia union, picking up their first win, I believe playoff win in their team's history and a breakdown of this one, Virginia union at halftime led by a very narrow margin. 21, 20 is absolutely anyone's game. And uh, Wingate kind of came out on top in that second half. They go to up 28, 21 and um, this kind of, it could have slipped away from Virginia union at any point. And kudos to them. They bounce back. 20 seconds left in this one. And uh, Jeremy Francis, nine-yard touchdown pass from RJ under center there. They even things up at 28 apiece. That means we have overtime. Wingate has the ball first. 39-yard field goal off the foot of Caleb Bonesteel. Hell of a name. Uh, 31-28. Now, Virginia Union, they have the opportunity to tie it up with a field goal or to go for the entire win. You saw it there in the, in the clips towards the end of it. The tush push kind of on the, uh, on the goal line there. That was RJ under center for them. The one-yard touchdown run seals the deal for Virginia Union. And just an absolute gritty, gutting out kind of win for this Virginia Union squad. And I will pull up the the little graphic here because I thought this was a cool graphic. Um, And it also shows you right there on the bottom, first playoff win in school history. Kudos to the Panthers. That is an absolutely incredible feat against a really solid opponent in Wingate. And it was, like I said, it was a big day for HBCUs. And here you have a cool graphic that we had put out on social in collaboration with some other people. The first time two HBUs have won a Division II playoff game in the same season. In the 51-year history of the D2 playoffs. That's awesome. That is incredible. And I'm just glad that we're here to witness history, history excuse me, and that these two teams are able to perform at this level. So kudos to both those squads. Talk about Virginia Union and uh, Miles earlier on in the show. Couple more games here at the D2 level to recap. This one I won't spend uh, too much time on, although it did have an incredible finish. East Stroudsburg going on the road to take on California PA in a PSAC matchup. And this one, East Stroudsburg comes out swinging here. 14 10 uh, early in the second quarter. They certainly had some things going. Uh, Tier Mills would score in the second corner. Bobby Boyd had some things going as well on the ground for this Cal PA squad. But going into halftime, East Stroudsburg was up. It was Bo Hazer 
hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, on the touchdown pass from Sean McTaggart, 21-13 going into halftime, and Cal would respond coming out of the half. This one got very interesting towards the end of the game. A touchdown pass from Tag McTaggart to John Siggins for ESU gave them the lead 27-19 in the third quarter. It took until the fourth quarter for Cal to respond with a Davis Black quarterback one-yard run there, a 77-yard drive, 13 plays. We had things tied up at 27-27. Now, back and forth, back and forth, vying for what would ultimately, assumedly be the game-winning type of play came down to literally the last second. Cal PA has the ball, needs to make something happen. Anthony Bytko, 29 yards as time expires for the Vulcans. There it is. He knocks it through the uprights. The Vulcans advance to the next round. They take this one 30 to 27 off the foot of their savior in this one. He had another, um, I believe, one other kick in this one as well, and uh, two other field goals, excuse me. So was a big part of this uh, this Vulcan team. Has been throughout the course of the season, but certainly today felt like a very, very important piece of that. So shout out to him. Shout out to that uh, Cal PA squad that is continuing their playoff hunt. A couple more D2 games here. Let's talk about Central Washington at Western Colorado. This one, a late comeback from the Wildcats, not quite enough to give them the edge over the Mountaineers out of Western Colorado. The Armac team comes out on top here on their own field. 28-21, the Mountaineers take this one. And when you look at this, this Western Colorado squad did get up relatively early. You look at um, in the second quarter, it was kind of anyone's game. And then in the third quarter, 21-10, Western Colorado takes the lead. And a couple scores from this uh, Central Washington squad made things interesting. But it simply just uh, was not enough, too much to overcome here. A Mountaineer team that we've seen has just been really, really proficient uh, defensively and offensively. They play a lot of complimentary ball over there. Drew Nash, star of the show for this Mountaineer team. He was 12-21, 164 yards and three touchdowns through the air. He also carried it 19 times for 127 yards and a touchdown on the ground. He literally was the majority of their offense on the day. He did a very good job at that. Now, uh, Kennedy McGill for CWU, 17 carries, 113 yards, and a touchdown of his own. Tyler Flanagan had uh, some plays in the ground as well, but uh, McGill under center for that Central Washington squad certainly had some things going. I think the one thing that uh, we've come to associate with this Central Washington team, we didn't really see as many takeovers or takeaways, excuse me, generated from this squad and actually what we saw is that central washington fumbled twice and lost both those fumbles in this one so the turnover battle certainly went the way of the mountaineers and they were able to capitalize on that that was a big part of this game central washington did win the time time possession battle pretty decisively by 10 minutes 35 to 25 minutes which is really surprising when you think about it and there were four or four in the red zone but when you talk about some penalties at certain points in the game, and you talk about uh, a couple of those fumbles, those are going to be drive stoppers, and it's really hard to bounce back from that, especially when most of these drives Central Washington was sustaining were on the ground. They had 15 first downs rushing the ball, and something as simple as a a big-time penalty can certainly slow down that kind of attack if you're Central Washington. Okay, moving forward, still in Super Region number 4, Bemidji State. At Angelo State, the Beavers, who have quite the track record now in recent history coming to the NCAA playoff in their fourth straight national tournament. And for the second year in a row, they go down to Texas and pick up a big-time win against a Lone Star Conference opponent. The Beavers win this one 24-14. Last year, it was UTPB. This year, it's the Rams from Angelo State. Bemidji State, a really impressive performance from this squad. Not too many video highlights here, just a little bit of the... uh, post-game celebration from the boys after this one. Bemidji State scores 10 in the fourth quarter, and that would kind of be the separator for this squad. Sam McGath uh, was the man under center for this Bemidji squad, and they really didn't do much through the air. It was Connor Carver who had things going, rushing the ball for BSU. Eight carries, 114 yards and a tud, one of those going for about 60 
that feels pretty nice, excuse me, for Bemidji State. Um, like I said, not much going on through the air. 7 to 14 for 30 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. That was not the name of the game for this Bemidji State attack. When you look at it defensively, though, you start to understand that that's where Bemidji State really separated themselves. Running the ball, Bemidji State finished with 231 yards while Angelo was held to only 93. 230 yards of total offense for this Rams team is not something we have come to expect. You also look here, two interceptions for this Bemidji State squad. Um, that was a really tough thing uh, for Angelo State to overcome, the two interceptions through the air, and that's where uh, you kind of get away with a little bit less total offense when you're able to generate those turnovers if you're VSU. And I think um, other things that stand out, Bemidji State, 2 of 15 on third down. Like, really not the best offensive day for Bemidji. But defense travels in an environment like this where you have to travel across the country. You know your defense is going to show up. We've talked about Marcus Hansen and that front defensive unit for Bemidji State. They are certainly going to be a threat as we continue on into the playoffs. Now, Lenore Ryan at West Alabama, another game that really came down to it. West Alabama, they fall short. Lenore Ryan the one SAC team still standing in the D2 football playoffs with Carson Newman and Wingate both dropping their playoff contest. Now, this game was a shootout, uh, much more so than some of the other ones. It was a kind of quiet first quarter, 7-7 seven to seven at the end of the first. There was a combined 37 points scored in the second quarter alone of this one, which feels pretty noteworthy. So we'll take a look here at some of the highlights from this one, courtesy of ABC 11, excuse me. And when you look at this one right here, the biggest notes from this Lenore Ryan squad, that's Jalen Ferguson, the man under center for the Bears. 22 of 40, 411 yards, and three touchdowns for Lenore Ryan. He was doing it all for them on the day. And uh, that, that really was the name of the game. They didn't do too much rushing the ball, only had 49 yards on 27 attempts. But uh, a lot of really good things going on for this LRU attack. Uh, Adonis McDaniel, seven catches for 200 yards and two touchdowns. You had Sonya Yates with five catches and 107 of his own. And uh, some really good things going on, like I said, for this Lenore Ryan team that we've seen battle back and forth. Some uncharacteristic losses for this squad. But again, you bring in a new coach like Doug Soshith from the NAIA level at Kaiser, and he's still got this program doing exactly what we've come to expect them to do in November, which is win meaningful football games. And for Lenore Ryan... They are very good at that. Uh, Damian Savage had the pick on the day for Lenore Ryan through the air. That was a big takeaway. Jalen Willis led the squad defensively with 10 tackles and a TFL. And then you had JT Black, who forced and recovered a fumble for this Bears squad. But here's a look at the full bracket. When it comes to D2 football this coming week, Man, do we have some great matchups. Up in Super Region 1, Kutztown, Slippery Rock, back for the PSAC showdown. You got Ashland and Cal PA, three PSAC squads still standing up there in Super Region 1, which is wild. Over in Super Region 2, Valdosta State and Miles Square off, along with Lenore Ryan and Virginia Union, both still alive. In number three, some of the highly anticipated matchups, Ferris State and Central Oklahoma, followed by Harding and GVSU up there in Lubbers Stadium. You got CSU Pueblo and Minnesota State. In Super Region number four. And finally, Western Colorado in Bemidji. Comment below. Let me know who you think you got winning at all. I'm excited to see how these playoffs play out. But let's get over to our second guest conversation and get talking D3 and NAI football. Also joining the show tonight, this man has taken over the starting role in a big way for the Pirates out west at Whitworth University. A team coming off their second straight year with a first-round playoff victory. It's the quarterback himself, the man under center for the Pirates, Ryan Blair. What's up, dude? How's it going? Dude, excited to get you on here. You're repping the brand per usual, I imagine, over there. Always, yep. Doesn't come off. Um, but for you guys, I mean, you're going to be playing ball on Turkey Day this year. I feel like that's always the goal of everyone who plays football from the age of, like, four. Definitely. Yeah, I never got to experience playing, uh, practicing on Thanksgiving. So it's good to have it for the second year in a row in college, for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, this is definitely not the first time for you guys, second year in a row that you guys have not only gotten into the dance, but also you get to host. 
And I think that's definitely a big part of that as well, at least in the first round, right? We'll talk about moving forward, what the, the path looks like for, for you and your squad moving forward. But talk about how crucial that is for you guys and the environment you have there. And admittedly one that I have not seen myself in person, but talk about that game day environment and what it's meant to have a playoff, meaningful, very meaningful football there the last two Novembers. Yeah, no, it was huge. I think having a home playoff game has been big for us. Um, I know traveling is not ideal by any means, mm -hmm. um, but being able to stay at home as on our team too, around us for the entire week, stuff like that, having family come through for our chapels the night before, stuff like that. Just getting to enjoy one more time on the pine ball with our guys was an awesome experience for sure, especially at the end of November in a playoff game like that. 100%. You guys, for those not familiar, up there in Washington and, um, you know, a lot of those opponents in the first round are not going to be the the ones that you have to fly across the country for. We're going to talk about one in a little bit that you'll definitely, I would hopefully assume you'll be getting on a plane and not uh, taking the big old bus over to Illinois. But, um, you know, moving on from that, let's talk about, you know, this weekend, right, in the matchup. And I think you can't talk about this game without first how this one ended. And it certainly wasn't a wire-to-wire -wire win from, from you guys by any means. You had some strong performances, but, man, Right there on the six-yard line, an interception to close things off. Your defense stands tall. I believe it was Omari Williams who got that one and, and pulled it down. Ultimately, the defense comes in, interception. That had to have been roller coaster of emotions. Walk me through those, those last couple moments, moments on that series. Yeah, it definitely wasn't a comfortable feeling on the sideline. Um, I didn't necessarily have doubt in our defense by any means, but we definitely put them in a tough spot for sure. They definitely bailed us out there at the end. Um, we started strong on offense, kind of shot ourselves in the foot with a few drives kind of in the, the start of the second half, the end of the first half. Um, but overall, I think our defense really kept us in that game. So that was a huge play by Omari at the end and just overall the last drive of the game. That is massive, absolutely. And offensively, maybe struggling a little bit earlier on, you talked about it. I think the ground game, probably not as much going on there as you would have liked offensively for you guys. But uh, on the other side of that, 300 yards and three touchdowns does have a decent ring to it. It felt good, for sure. Um, I think whatever we can do to put points up on the board, I know, as you said, like, it was a little struggle to run the ball and stuff like that. But yeah, um, whatever we all know, whatever it takes to get the win, if we have to pass it 50 times, if we have to run it 50 times, whatever can get us the most points on the board and get a W at the end of the day is what we need to do. A great quarterback answer, by the way. Absolute leader mm -hmm. answer right there. That's textbook. Um, don't let me bait you into that. But uh, nonetheless, a fantastic stat line from you. You guys obviously got it done through the air, and I think that's a great sign of a good team and a great sign of a team that should be playing in these meaningful games in November in a playoff type of atmosphere. This isn't the first time you guys have been outgained by even a large margin. I look back and reference that Chapman game early on in the year. You guys outgained almost by a number of 2-1, to one, and uh, – you still play some very complimentary football, and you talk about the offense and defense, how they play off of each other. But I do have to imagine offensively that, you know, a performance like that has to light a fire under your ass. Like, hey, we got to pick this thing up. And the defense is not that they're carrying you guys by any means. You still had a lot of big time plays, but just light a fire in the fact that, like, let's be the reason we win the game. You know, go out there and let, I want to have the ball in our hands to finish this one out. Definitely. I think just like what you said, complimentary football, I think the defense has really shown that they can hold their ground. And I think for us on offense, like we really pride ourselves in like as long as we can score every drive, really, there's nothing that we have to worry about for the, okay. our defense yeah. or anything like that. So I think definitely we're trying to capitalize on those missed opportunities in the red zone or in the plus 50. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking to do next week. 100%, and I'm sure you've probably looked – I mean, it's Sunday as we're recording this, so you maybe haven't gone through the entire notebook. i hopefully take a little bit of time off here too. But when looking back at that game and obviously playing through it, where are some of those areas where you think, without getting into schematics and, of course, all those things, that you think that you maybe left a few plays out in the field or, or in formationally or um, just in your area of your offense, where are some of those areas you guys you think you can make that big jump? Um, now, again, it's week – what, 11, 12 for you guys. So it's not like we're going to see a totally different team on Saturday. I'm not naive to that. But where do you think there's, the ceiling is still higher for this Pirate squad? Um, I think eliminating penalties, stuff like that. I know we didn't have too many penalties yesterday, but those kind of end up being drive killers for sure. Yeah. Um, just us executing. I know uh, between reads, making accurate throws, stuff like that, all that stuff that's in my control, checking protections, putting us in the best case possible to just go out and make plays distribute the ball to the playmakers and the guys that can, you know, get us into the end zone. So whatever I can try to do to get us in that spot and capitalize on those opportunities for sure.
And you've done a great job of that. And that wasn't something that, you know, at this case of the game, there's a lot of quarterbacks now in this D3 playoff that have been the guy at their school for two, three, four years, those kind of things. You, at least from my perspective, looking at and trying to do my research, seems like you came in and took the reins this year. Not that you hadn't seen snaps before, but coming in and really being endorsed as the guy this season is is not unique to your position. How have you guys been able to, you know, 10 wins in back-to-back seasons for the first time in school history, how have you been able to experience that success with turnover at really a lot of key positions on both sides of the ball? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes from just the experience that we have. I know we have 32 seniors in this class and we have eight fifth years on the roster. So yeah, it's a huge class for sure. And I think coming from both sides of the ball, even the special teams too, like it's a very senior led group and everybody kind of knows after last year, we've had a taste of the playoffs and stuff like that. So we see the other teams that are out there and what we're competing with. So we really just trying to, you know, drive our culture and push that into a new direction, um, trying to make it just kind of a habit that we're getting into the playoffs each year and just doing our thing at this point. Make it uh, not the exception, but the, uh, not, and I lost the word, but basically expect it, right? Like makes that something that's supposed to be uh, a thing that you guys go on and do and repeat and not just a one-off, right? Sustain that success, whether that's you guys or the next group that comes in, you know, wearing those uniforms. Was there any kind of big learning curve for you at the start of the year as far as, you know, being that guy week in and week out, how you're handling yourself, whether that's on the field or your game day preparation, some of those things? How have you kind of approached this role and taken on more of that vocal, maybe vocal or just, uh, you know, in your play, that leadership role? Yeah, I think I would credit that a lot. Um, just sitting last year behind Austin Ewing, um, yeah. So he was our starter last year oh, yeah. and he came from Southern Utah, had a great year, built a great relationship with him. And I got to see just kind of what he was able to do on the field and off the field and how he carried himself, how he prepared for games, stuff like that. I think everything that he did helped kind of get me to where I'm at right now. I think I was able to learn a lot of different things from him and I'm super grateful for that. I love that, man. That's, that's awesome. And you know, the uh, tough part ain't over yet. You still got a lot of ball to play, hopefully, if you're your guys over there. But one opponent at a time this week, it happens to be the Cardinals from North Central, which with that name brings a whole lot with it. You're making the trip all the way from Washington to Illinois to play at North Central. A lot that comes with that. But for you guys, when it comes to that trip and this opponent, uh, what goes into a big trip like that? And how does that change up your week as opposed to obviously hosting in the first round? Yeah, so we'll end up leaving on Friday, obviously, for the game. So that part is a little different in the case that this past week we were able to stay at home and do our walkthrough and all that kind of stuff and just um, relax a little bit more, I guess you could yeah. say. Just Only Friday, huh? I feel like that I would have expected maybe earlier. Yeah, no, I think we're heading out Friday morning. So okay. it'll be an early plane ride out there. Um, the rest of the week is still going to be the same. Like, we'll have our normal practice schedule, stuff like that. Obviously, going to be watching lots of film and – taking notes on these guys and stuff like that, preparing for a normal week for sure. But yep. Um, yeah. No, I hear you there. And I think that's the big thing with some of this, this travel you look at when the big 10, for example, annexes the whole West coast and how that throws off the schedules of so many college athletes and teams across the country. And now your quote unquote typical week now turns into, Hey, on Wednesday, we're getting out there to play a Friday game. You know what I mean? There are some, some of these things that sometimes happen that your whole week, could be thrown kind of into a disarray. But that, that's good that you guys are keeping some semblance of uh, of normalcy around there. Now, um, again, Sunday night here, haven't done too much prep. We, we talk about North Central. What do you know about that opponent heading into this and you got to be aware of for the cards? Um, well, we know that they've been to the last four national championships. Uh, so obviously they're a really good team. They've got a Fair really enough. good defense, a stud at quarterback. Um, yeah, they're a really, really good team for sure. And we're just going to do what we can to – to game plan these guys, do what we can do, watch a lot of film on these guys and just study them up. Now, the last one I had for you is, as far as like an opponent like this, I've seen two very different, and again, we probably will get into this more throughout the course of the week. I've seen two very different approaches from different coaching staffs and different uh, kind of guys when you go up against, you would say kind of quote-unquote marquee opponents, like a North Central team that has obviously seen a lot of success at the national level. There's one half of people that totally acknowledge that and say, hey, these guys are absolute players. We have to know exactly this, that, and whatever. There's another side that says nameless, faceless opponent. Treat them exactly like everyone else. Is that, with the nod there, is that kind of more of the style you guys see yourself heading into this week? I would say it would be kind of more on that first end. Uh, We know we've got a lot of respect for these guys. We've seen that they've had that 
um, success that they've had. We know that this is going to be a really tough opponent and that Absolutely. kind of just drives our, our focus and our determination up to the next level. I think that's important. I, I, I've always been someone who you can always, whether you like it or not, you can always respect the the dudes on the other side of the ball because, I mean, shit, you're doing the exact same thing. I mean, you respect mm-hmm. your guys playing with you. You may as well expect the guys you're playing against um, in most circumstances, right, um, until they give you a reason not to. But, brother, I'm excited for this weekend. I definitely will be, will be tuned into that one. I thank you very much for joining me tonight talking some ball. Of course. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Have a good night, Ryan. All right, moving on to the Division Three playoff world where we had a pseudo-playoff uh, play-in round, so to speak, and we've got actually more teams playing in week two of the playoffs than week one. But still, Jimmy, a lot of great games in that week one slate. A couple of them did get out of hand, but uh, we had some really competitive ones that came down to the wire. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Well, let's start things off then. We had Alfred State going on the road at Endicott, and this one, I think – a lot of people kind of expected to be a dominant performance. Then you look at the final score and just the box score in itself, you see 44 to nothing, and you're like, holy shit, the goals took care of business. But, you know, when I sat down and watched this game, it was a really slow start for this, you know, this Endicott offense. There were some incomplete passes, a narrowly missed interception in the first quarter from that Alfred State defense. And, uh, you know, they got them, that defense got them into a couple third and longs. They were pretty uncomfortable to start things off. And I just don't think the 44 nothing is very indicative of how this game started in the first half. No, yeah, for the majority of the first half, like you said, it was 3 nothing. Like there, uh, Alfred State was hanging around. A lot of people were not anticipating that. Um, like you said, just a couple, like that costly, going for, going forward on fourth down and one on your own 20, it kind of, you know, it was pretty tough uh, to not get that. Obviously, it's a pretty big gamble to take. Um, you know, they ran the ball really effectively uh, late as well, Endicott did, and that was pretty, three rushing touchdowns in the fourth quarter. You know, you just got to go to your bread and butter, and, um, and you're up late, and they sure they sure did that. Yeah, sure. yeah, they definitely seem to have control as the game went on of that line of scrimmage. And you see, you know, watching the tape here, the defense stepped up in a big way, generated a couple turnovers, and you start making some plays behind the line of scrimmage. That's all recipe for success, but you said it. That fourth and one on their own 20, they don't convert for the Pioneers. And uh, the goals only got a field goal out of it. So for me, I was like, that's actually a win. You know, you give up the ball on your own 20-yard line, which was a hell of a gamble, by the way. Um, but they only get a yeah. field goal out of that, and I felt like the Pioneers are still in this one over there at Alfred State. And as the game went on, it really just started to uh, to slip away from them. And to highlight some of those individual performances that you had kind of mentioned there, I mean, <clears throat> in the air, nothing ridiculous, um, 160 yards for this Endicott offense. But on the ground, they had a couple guys that certainly stood out. And, you know, you finished with 343 yards net rushing on the ground, and that is yeah. – very, very good telling sign of a dominant performance when it comes to the ground game and the line of scrimmage. And I talked about that defensive effort. Uh, Twardowski had that interception, the one of them, and then Mason Bakery with the other for that Endicott defense. Not a whole lot of sacks in the day, but that really was more because not a whole lot of dropbacks for this Alfred State team. And uh, in the TFL department, though, you had five different guys registering some hits behind the line of scrimmage. So Endicott smoothly cruises through round one, but uh, how about that round two matchup? Yeah, that'll be a fun one. No, I was, I was talking about that one last – we were off the air, we were talking about it last week because we didn't want to just assume Endicott was going to win. But, no, that'll be, that'll be a super fun one to watch next week. That is going to be uh, that is going to be a really exciting one. But we can move forward. This one I know I was excited about and had some pretty high expectations coming in, that being Coe College heading over to Bethel. And this was the one where uh, – we thought Co was actually hosting this game. There was kind of an error on the selection show from the NCAA and the yeah, and kind of that whole one. site. <laughs> that was a little bit of a misstep there, but uh, that ends up the game being at Bethel. The Royals take this one in a very, very close contest. 31-26, probably the more back and forth of the uh, early slate of games. What did you see in this one from the Royals? Uh, well, I saw that uh, Co did everything in their power to take away Joey Kidder, especially in the red zone. I don't know if you saw this picture, Kobe, but they they had like you know like the picture of Megatron and against like the uh, the Saints or the Seahawks, or whatever. They had two yes. guys on him. Like I'm, a, they were doing that to Kidder in that game. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, somewhat, I think Mikey Schultz tweeted that. Shout out to Mikey. But uh, yeah, Kidder still had a heck of, had a heck of a game. Thirteen receptions, one hundred nine. Uh, uh, Micah New Newald, sorry <laughs> Newald, that's a tough one to pronounce. Fifteen for one hundred nine as well. Uh, Bethel was really efficient through the air, but they did turn over the ball three times. They fumbled three times, but Co also fumbled three times. So a lot of turnovers in this one. A little bit sloppy on both sides, but uh, Bethel still managed to come out with the victory. 
Yeah, and I think a big turning point for me in this one, I mean, you go into halftime, Bethel is up 21-20. It's still at, at literally anyone's game at this point. And watching this game, they're very close to scoring at the end of the half, all the way down in co side of the field. They come out, they don't get their last time out off, and the clock runs down, and they go into halftime. Again, still winning by one point, but that felt like at that point in the game, and this ends up being a five-point, one-possession ball game, that was a costly mistake from that Bethel squad. I believe they still had timeouts on the board and just were not able to get that one off. And I'll have to double check and make sure I'm correct on that one. But watching that game, it felt like that was a really big momentum swing opportunity for this Cohawk squad because I think a lot of coaches will talk about you have to go and have that momentum going into the half and out of the half. Those are kind of swing plays and swing moments, those two, three minutes going into that halftime and then coming out of who's going to determine the pace of play moving forward. But we'll keep things going. This one... This got out of hand. Mount St. Joseph yeah. goes on the road to John Carroll, and I had this one on. I've got a lot of notes on this one, Jimmy, because admittedly I was quite dumbfounded watching certain portions um, of this game, and I think it starts here with the offense for John Carroll. They established themselves first, running the football between the tackles. They finished with a field goal, still kind of feeling out that defense, but very much so establishing the line of scrimmage and felt like they were really getting comfortable building confidence, you know, the blue streaks and – the run game starts to dominate in the next drive. This time, they finish with a touchdown. So first, you get a field goal. Then you get a touchdown. And it felt like it was this snowball effect for John Carroll. And um, this started to get really out of hand. It felt like, you know, the first half, the JCU offense just didn't leave the field. Uh, Mason Russ back-to-back -back sacks on third down for that Blue Streaks defense. And then there was the uh, what-the-hell 39-yard sack that – we can't, I should preface, like, we can't show any of the video because, like, ESPN Plus, and I wouldn't get monetized if I, yeah. if I used it. But I will find, I put out that tweet of from the live stats. A 39-yard sack is one of the most ridiculous things that I've seen in a while. And yeah. admittedly, it wasn't really a sack. The quarterback found the turf monster 39 yards back in the backfield. Here's the... Here's the look from the live stat sheet. Um, no oh, shot wow. at Tyler. I mean, he was he was doing his best out there, but he did find the turf monster and ended up eating it. Loss of 39 yards was a, just kind of a really great way of putting a bow on this one. But yeah, enough. I mean, enough from me. I'll add this: the icing on the cake here. John Carroll. They recover the ensuing kickoff, so they go on and score after this possession. They kick it off. It was like kind of a normal ish kick, kind of a skied kick. And they got down there and recovered it before MSJ did. No, yeah, that's that's what you cannot have. It kind of uh, looks like the Bears punt return today. I don't know if you saw that, but uh, what's that? The but Minnesota punted one to the Bears today. It went off the guy's foot there. Like, yes, poison, poison, poison. Yeah, it was, it was, Just, those always those are brutal, man. Those are tough. Yeah, I mean, this one got out of hand. You went into halftime. It was thirty-one to nothing, blue streaks, and and they kind of added on to that. They called the dogs off a little bit. In the second half, yeah. um, but again, when you're up 31, that's probably what you should do. You know, yeah. So it's tough in a playoff know. game, though. You know, you want to keep your foot on the gas, but at some point, you know, and th and that's what it seems they did. They did. And at some yep. point, it's like get the guys out of there. I mean, you don't want to have some of those guys out there that could risk, you know, twisting a knee, twisting an ankle, some of those kind of soft tissue things too. Like mm -hmm. those are susceptible to happen whenever. Yeah, and you don't want to lose those guys before, you know, you play uh, the Purple Raiders next week, too. I was going to say, because that yeah. gears us up now for a big-time OAC mass up matchup, excuse me, and that's going to be, mm. I mean, we talk about earlier on the slate, Endicott and Cortland and some of these other, Platteville, Wartburg, uh, Johns mm -hmm. Hopkins, Grove that you go down the list, like, this is it now, man, we're here. Yeah, it's going to be a fun round of Division three football. Like, it's going to be maybe the most competitive round of them all. Yeah, and this next game, thankfully, was a lot more competitive. That being Maryville traveling to Barry. They take this one 2016, and, um, you know, when I was watching this one, Barry, they drive down the field on the second possession. They punch it in from the one-yard line, and I had heard that Barry had been struggling with some of their kicking game, and I admittedly didn't go back and exactly check the statistics on that. I was really wondering why they went for two um, on the opening score, and it was, again, I guess no shots at them. It was a dumb two-point try. It was kind of like a pseudo swinging gate type deal where they kicked out a bunch of their offensive linemen and then did a direct snap, and it just got stuffed. And, you know, from there, Maryville responds to big explosive pass plays. They drive right down the field, score a good PAT, and now you find yourself down 7-6. In a game like this where it finishes 2016, I mean, that's – those are critical points, and so I don't, I don't know, I guess, the extent of the kicking struggles for Barry, but that felt like a, an interesting decision. 
Yeah, I don't know what the analytics would say about that one, but like you said, like maybe it's something within the team. Maybe they just want to go for two. Yeah. Like kickers as an issue. But, um, you know, Barry is very stagnant on offense. They're held at 210 yards offensively. And Maryville's got a pretty solid defense. So, I mean, that's to be – maybe not to be expected, but, I mean, 210 yards is not enough. You're not going to score a lot of points with only 210 yards. Um, no, you're definitely not. And Brandon no, Cade, who's no. been kind of the face of this Barry squad, 27 carries, 58 yards for him out of that backfield. And you're able to eliminate him, at least really minimize his impact in a game like this. It's a really great uh, recipe for success. The other big metric, obviously, Christian Lewis under center for Barry had three interceptions on the day. And so turning the ball over combined with the fact that you do not have a really predominantly great running game in this game, not that they say they haven't been able to run in the past, what that does is it totally tips the time of possession away from you. And you're keeping your defense out in the field way longer than maybe they should be. So for Maryville, those are all really big pieces um, to their success. You had Jaden Smith, Devin White, and Grant Henderson all had interceptions on the day for that Maryville defense. And that was that was really big time uh, kind of deal. And to go back to the two-point conversion thing, it is interesting because if you remember, when I went down to Elma and, and talking with Scotty down there and one of their, on their coaching staff, he had said that, hey, if we score first, we're going for two every time. And the opponents know it, but we yeah. have found that scoring first and adding on to that and seeing an 8 nothing on the scoreboard is such a big momentum swing for us. So I'd be very curious to hear maybe Barry has a very similar philosophy in that department. Yeah, it sounds very Dan Campbell-y. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it sounds like something Dan Campbell would do. It does, and they took care of business today. I mean, 10-1 and one for the first time, whatever. Yeah, the Lions are really good. <laughs> I, am not, I am not looking forward to Thursday. It's going to be an ugly one. It's going to be ugly, dude. She's going to be eating day. turkey with tears coming down his face. Yeah. As if I would be. Division three right college football. football. Oh. No matter who they play. Man. Oh. Yeah. That is, today was today was a, a tough finish, dude. Um, but we'll swing over and talk more D3 ball. You had your sinus at King's College. This one came down to it. 32-29. Kings the Monarchs take this one and we had talked about Kings a little bit earlier on in the year and the fact that they were finally get over the proverbial hurdle that is Delaware Valley and so for them to do that inside of the MAC and now find their way into the playoffs and not only that pick up a win in the first round talk to me about this Monarch squad yeah man they ran the ball really really well uh, Russell Miner Shaw had himself a day 173 yards on the ground and a touchdown uh, when, when you run the ball that effectively you're going to find yourself winning a lot of football games as we said on this show numerous times especially in the playoffs when the weather gets colder so running that ball man maybe obviously we saw we saw that on full display this week. Yeah, and you saw there, and I roll on the tape, and you see him air it out now down the field. But there was a safety early on, too, and uh, your shine starts things off 3 nothing with a field goal. Then they tack on a safety and um, a touchdown to boot with that. Now, all of a sudden, it's 12 nothing in the second quarter, and this King squad had to be looking around like, what is going on right now? Absolutely just a different way to get up on a team, and I think their ability to rebound was very impressive because I don't think they found themselves in many holes like that throughout the course of the season. So for a relatively untested team, I think that was a really impressive rebound for them, and uh, what a momentum swing that is to get a safety when you're trying to bounce back and get your first points on the board and to be able to come back and do that. From there on, though, I mean, the second half was was full of a lot of scoring. I mean, 36 points in the second half alone from both these squads, and it came down right to the end. Your sinus has a 20-yard touchdown pass from Jalen Bradford to uh, Cameron Dennis with about six minutes left. That gave him the lead 29-25, and then Kings College comes down. It was all the way 25 seconds left in the game. Game. Mike DeGregorio, he had the nine-yard touchdown pass from Minor Shaw you talked about earlier. And with less than 30 seconds to go, they get out on top. They kick the extra or extra point to make it a three-point game, 32-29. And, um, you know, they needed a field goal to tie it. They were unable to get it. Defense comes up and, and gets the job done. So big-time win for that uh, that Monarch squad. Huge, huge. I mean, obviously, all playoff wins are huge, but. That I mean, one yeah. being in that, in, that, in that fashion, too, man, oh, man, it's awesome. Shout out to – thank you to ABC16 for that footage as well. I want to make sure I, I reference where I'm getting all this footage from. Um, yep. And to keep things going forward, we're going to head down to Texas in a matchup that – I think opened the eyes of a lot of people. Mary Harden Baylor caught a lot of flack heading into the playoffs this year. Only what three wins against division three opponents and people were coming there under fire because obviously you missed the playoffs last year for the first time. And who knows how long I'm not checking the stats right now. I'll tell you, it's been a long time. And this year to be on the brink 
and still find their way into the dance, even though playing maybe not the toughest Division Three schedule. I think people were doubting, and they kind of silenced a lot of those people this weekend. Uh, video courtesy of KWKT Fox 44. Mary Harden Baylor goes into Trinity and picks up the win, Jimmy, 29-22. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I, as we talked about, I mean, that catch on my second touchdown, all that. Back in the end zone, that was so sweet, dude. That was beautiful, and I think we'll get yeah. to it here in a second. This might actually be it right here. Yeah. And bam. That's beautiful. Over the shoulder. Absolute dot from Q, by the way. Not going to take him out of the equation, but that was poetry. Yeah, that was that was wicked. And obviously, now next week they got Harden Simmons, that big, that big uh, rematch, as we talked about. They lost to him twice already. It's really hard to beat a team three times. Yes. It's really hard to beat a team three times. In the same season. I know. It's I mean, when do you stuff. see this happen? You don't, is the answer. You, you really don't In see college, this happen. especially. I mean, you, yeah, NFL, you know, you got two division games, you play them in the playoffs, like maybe that works out. But, like, I mean, it's already, they have a pretty small conference to begin with. You play everybody twice. Yeah, the AFC right now is just in a very weird, bad spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah sure. it definitely it definitely is. And, um, you know, talk about UMHB, too. They dominated the special teams battle. They blocked a punt. That sets up a touchdown for the crew. Then they stopped a fake field goal attempt from the Tigers that saved a touchdown. So those felt like, to me, two really big swing kind of momentum plays. You talk about uh, when games can be boiled down to some of those big swing plays, those sudden change type moments. UMHB won the day with those alone, I thought. And those are kind of two examples of that now trinity at the end of the half they end with a touchdown it felt necessary to keep them in it but they scored again on a great ball thrown on the run and that for me was kind of a oh like shit this might actually be a game because at the time mary harden baylor is up 14 nothing in the second quarter talk about some of those swing plays and then going into half it's 14 12 that was a really big swing in a matter of i'm not kidding two minutes they scored with a minute 54 left to get the ball back and they scored with 48 seconds left in the second half, or second quarter, excuse me. So now you go into halftime, 14-12, and it was literally anyone's game. Came down to it, though. Uh, Asa Osborne had a one-yard touchdown run, and um, Mary Harden Baylor takes this thing in the final two minutes over in-state Trinity Tigers. Woo! Ooh, that, was a, that was a good one. That was a good one. That was. And... Um, not to be a letdown here. This one, not so much. 59-14, no. UW lacrosse playing host to Northwestern. The Eagles, Coach Janice and company down there, they got the job done. Talk to me about it. Yeah, uh, Kyle Haas continued to deliver for the, for the Eagles. 257 yep. through the air, four touchdowns. Jack Janke added two more uh, receiving touchdowns. And uh, lacrosse is a really dynamic offense, as I was trying to say this week. Um, but Buster, obviously, going to the playoffs, you got to tip the cap to them for making it. Um, they Tough team. I mean, it just ran into a buzzsaw. The cross is a really, really good football program. That's just kind of what happens sometimes. But um, good season for Northwestern, though. Eight sacks on the day for that lacrosse defensive unit, dude. Yeah. Yeah, they get after the quarterback. Eight sacks. Eight sacks. 50 rushing yards they allowed. You know, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to be really happy here oh. if you're lacrosse, who punted only once in the entire contest. Um, there's a lot to be really happy here about. Uh, but – it's, you know, it's next week, right? And they got a big time matchup coming up. They actually lost time possession battle too, which I think was was kind of a weird, a weird metric. Thirty two yeah, minutes to twenty eight. So, when you score so fast, I mean, you're gonna lose time. Yeah, possession. just off the field. <laughs> yeah. Get on, get off, and you know there were some other things that certainly went their way, but now it's like, how do you flush that if you're lacrosse and really gear up for this matchup, St. John's, right, this coming week? No, yeah, it'll be a huge game. Um, that'll be really prepared. Uh, I see Studer didn't really. A lot. I don't know if he's injured or not, but maybe they're arrested him for next week. But um, no, obviously it's gonna be a huge one in that environment, especially. You know what I was thinking though? There might not be as much of a home field advantage because a lot of the students will be home for Thanksgiving. But that's kind think, of an interesting like, they point. Still they would still pack that stadium, I would assume, but like that's a tough weekend to have uh, the students all on break because like that home field advantage is so huge for them. I think a lot of people run into that problem. It's something that you see very often that these playoff games, especially second round of the playoffs, right? And you're like, yeah. why are there, why is there nobody at these games? But you're right. All the students are on break. And so if you're a place that really relies on that student body to show up, which uh, admittedly most of these places are, uh, it could be a little bit less of an advantage, but you know, I guess we'll see. Let's go out West. Pomona Pitzer taking on Whitworth over there. The pirates, they take this one 21, 13 video courtesy of KREM two news and Whitworth, 
talking with uh, with Ryan Blair in, in this episode, the quarterback for them, Jimmy, and I think the most impressive thing for this Whitworth team is to win even when things aren't necessarily going all in their favor. They were outgained in this one by a pretty large margin. They've done it a couple times over the course of the year offensively, the running game not going incredibly well for the Pirates. They're able to get some big plays through the air, but when you look at defensively, they step up and they make timely plays like the interception on the six-yard line to close things off. I think that's a really telling sign of a team that could potentially make a run. Now, of course, I say that very well knowing that North Central is on the other side of this week. But uh, when you're outgained in that kind of fashion and still find a way to gut out and win playoff football games in November, that's a really good sign. Yeah, and uh, Ryan Blair was the leader of that charge. Going 303 through the air, three touchdowns. Did get sacked three times. But like you said, like this team's really good with adversity. They bounce back. They don't let it, they don't let it get to them. Uh, Receiving-wise, uh, Evan Liggett had himself a day. 130 yards and a touchdown for him along with seven catches. So, you know, they leaned on that pass game, and it worked out quite well for them. It definitely has, and that that was uh, Omari Williams on the uh, on the game saving interception, the game clinching, I guess so to speak. That was uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, play on the day. And uh, Pitzer two interceptions through the air. That certainly is going to bite you in the ass at some point, man. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, um, you know, Pitzer outgained him three fifty eight to three hundred three. So not an incredible. Or that's just through the air. Excuse me, four thirty one to three forty. So almost by a hundred yards on total offense. Otherwise, I guess some kind of. Metrics that stand out, the two interceptions I talk about, Whitworth did win the time possession battle. They were atrocious on third down, one of nine. Mm, And that's not something that, I mean, we talked about it earlier with Ryan. There were a couple penalties that kind of stalled out some of those drives, some areas that maybe they can shore up as they move on. And that is a long trip over to (laughs) Illinois, Jimmy. But I'm, again, I'm excited. I, I think not that North Central has not been tested. They've beat a couple quality teams this year. I am very curious to see this result. I'm not going to sit here and pick Whitworth as the upset. I think I'd favor North Central going into this one, but like heavily. But I want to see what exactly the cards do with this Whitworth team, this Pirate squad that has gutted out some wins against decent opponents this year. Yeah, I think North Central secondary is going to have to bring their A game for sure. I mean, when you have a, a, a dynamic pass game, you're going to have to stop the air. So, I mean, Amen. they come out there and generate some turnovers. I mean, North Central is North Central. I mean, I think this will be – Pretty convincing victory, but I don't think Whitworth is going to duck their tail by any means. They're going to come out no. there. They're ready to go, man. Like, it's Whitworth versus everybody. I mean, truly, I don't think anyone Put it on a T-shirt. Guy. No, yeah, for real. I know I know Wheaton was wearing Wheaton versus everybody hats at the Isthmus Bowl, and that's kind of like their thing. But, you know, the WW, Wheaton, Whitworth, it's like, oh, you know. Fair, fair, <laughs> fair. Yeah, no, I'm excited, dude. And I mean, we'll have the, you know, we didn't talk much about North Central at the course of this season, maybe once or twice here and there. We're going to have a reason to talk about them this coming week. So I'm excited yeah. to, to talk about the cards and, and see what they've been doing up, there, up to over there, down there in Illinois. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Fun week. Fun week. Hell yeah. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you once again, dude. It's been good. I'm excited for this next round. This is going to be another ridiculous weekend of football. I can sense it. Yeah, man. I'm actually, I can actually watch it this week, too. It's yes. Yeah, we got to be we gotta be tapped in. Yeah, yes. absolutely, dude. Oh, you know it. You know Sweet. it. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Have a good rest of your night, dude. Good job, brother. Closing things off, you have some NAIA football to break down and discuss. Matt, I think the best way to start this off is the most ridiculous game of the day. We start there and then maybe <laughs> gradually get less ridiculous as we go through? Uh, Something like that. I feel like all these games kind of had something to them, which yeah. was pretty fun. Uh, You kind of naturally get that when you clump the bottom eight of a playoff together. So... Chaos ensued, um, and we're kicking things off with the 6-5 and five Pikeville football team getting it done against top 15 Baker, 42-35. to 35. Hell yeah. Uh, upset in every definition of the word. I think it is important to note, Baker did not have Truman Ewell's guard, who we have sung the praises of all season long playing in this game. And I could not get direct confirmation, but it also looked like Truman was pulled from their senior day Missouri Baptist game okay. to close the regular season. Uh, he was pulled pretty early from that game, like a couple plays in early. So I'm going to assume injury until I hear otherwise. But uh, yeah, it um, was it their undoing, I would say, because Sam, yep. excuse me, Sam Hedgeman started and he actually had a pretty decent day. Um, and both teams were extremely efficient. It was a classic shootout. Obviously, you can tell by the score, 42 to 35, that there's a lot of points put up. Um, but the ultimate game changer and what kind of tipped this in the favor of Pikeville, I would say, is Amon Williams. Uh, the run game for Baker was not necessarily there like it usually was. 
Uh, Sam Hedgeman was the leading rusher for the day for Baker, much like Sherman Yulesgard usually is, um, but got about 77 yards on top of his passing day. Um, and the entire team for Baker rushed for 180 yards. Amon Williams alone for Pikeville rushed for 152 and two touchdowns while averaging 6.3 yards per carry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely going to be the X factor for you. And also not necessarily going to get it done in the fourth quarter when you're Baker, when your final three drives of the game are a turnover on downs on the yeah. U-Pike 19-yard line and back-to-back -back interceptions to close the game. That will do it. There were five interceptions total in this one compared to only three punts for the entire duration of this game with how many points that were being put up. There were a lot of drives being finished in the end zone. The time of possession is listed here at 30 minutes and 8 seconds to 30 minutes and 2 seconds. <laughs> I don't know if we... Did we get 10 extra seconds we, of football, added, free football? We're adding... We got some some free football. We got 10 I seconds of free I think we got 10 seconds of free free ball. Can I say <laughs> free ball? Free ball. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take yeah. it. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's but that it. is... It's that incredibly is, even, that, whether that's 100% that. accurate or not. These teams were incredibly pitched even there. And um, red zone chances, you talk about two. Uh, that was a, a differentiator for this Pikeville squad. Five of five scoring in the red zone as compared to three of five of Baker. And um, that, that's a really big indicative piece is how you're, of how you're finishing off those drives. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to mention, too, Lee Kirkland, the guy who we talked about yes. last week for this Pikeville team. Getting it done, obviously, two picks is never ideal, but 24 for 35 for 310 and three touchdowns is mm -hmm. more than going to make up for that, um, mm -hmm. especially after coming off of a record-breaking end to his season. So uh, Pikeville just getting it done, man. And we talked about, you know, you make the playoff, now it's time to shut everybody up. They shut everybody up. The 6-5 and five team got it done. They're moving on to the next round. I'm excited to see what this team could do now that the wind is in their sails, they still have nothing to lose and they have already exceeded expectations. 963 yards of total offense. I was doing the very simple calculations. It took my brain the entire duration of you talking to do that. Um, <laughs> but that's a lot of yards in short, yeah. right? And I think the biggest takeaway from this is uh, I have certainly at times been against the whole idea of like league champions or conference champs getting an automatic bid into the playoffs. This would obviously be a great proponent for the other side of that argument and the fact that if you're good enough to win your league, there's a really good chance that you're good enough to go and upset somebody else. Absolutely. And now we have to look at that conference in a bit of a different lens from now on. Yeah. Because obviously Reinhardt and Point were there at five and five, six and five, whatever their records ended up being. So like maybe it's just hyper competitive. Uh it's a it's a fun spot for them to be in. And I'm always, I'm always a fan of an underdog, man. Can't go wrong with a good old classic uh, underdog story. So rooting for this Pikeville team going forward. Absolutely. You and uh, and many others. But uh, we will keep things going. Let's talk about Kansas Wesleyan going on the road at Dickinson State. The Blue Hawks there, mm -hmm. I believe, only lost the year. We talked about it earlier coming to that UW Stout squad early on. And 27-20, they take this one. It was a, a very competitive one. But in some metrics, it was maybe a little bit more one-sided. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dickinson State, for sure. The scoreboard shows it very close. And Dickinson State started very strong and ended very strong, and they kind of lulled in the middle. Um, but they played time of possession ball. Uh, is the biggest statistic for this team that stands out in the win. Uh, 38 minutes and 27 seconds of offense for the Blue Hawks. Yeah. That is that is going to more than enough get it done for you. And not to mention going 8 for 17 on third down compared to Kansas Wesleyan's 3 for 11. Uh, that's going to be 47% as opposed to Kansas Wesleyan's 27%. So those are two very important metrics that are going to get it done for you in the long run. Um, but this was just a ground and pound game. Definitely uh, a direct contrast to the last game that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, both teams kind of slugging it out. But Dickinson State would come out on top, get a playoff win, add it to their program resume, which they are, they've been building a, a really good one up there in the North Star for quite some time now. Um, and obviously with the North Star in the state that it is, they're going to be a new territory going forward. Um, and this is a good way to kind of kick off that new era going into it um, by getting a big playoff win. So 
I'm right with you there. It seems like you you hit a lot of the the big time points and um, scoring pretty back and forth in the first half, really even. And then uh, Dickinson State in that late third, start of the fourth quarter, separated themselves and and really came forward and, and got the job done. You look at the offensive production. I mean, you kind of talked about it, but uh, the split here: 29 first downs from Dickinson State to 12 of Kansas mm-hmm. Wesleyan would make you assume that the offensive kind of production was totally skewed one way or the other, but it was within 50 yards of each other. Like it wasn't this uh, total domination on one side of the ball, which was, I guess, very intriguing for me as someone who didn't uh, get to watch the game was yeah. pretty just odd, I guess, it, in it, general <laughs> um, interceptions on yeah. both sides, a couple fumbles lost. So there certainly were some turnovers along the way there, but nonetheless, really big win for that that Blue Hawks squad. Now, let's go over to a more ridiculous box score. That's Ottawa, Arizona at Friends. The Falcons still getting the job done. Cavante Baker still very much the dude, seemingly. Oh, yeah. Um, and like you said, if you want to look at a hilarious box score when you see a 47-35 to 35 game, Friends threw five passes in this game, and Ottawa, Arizona threw 40. <laughs> to, uh, to compare that there so obviously friends running the triple option have been doing it all season to massive success the uh the story to this one was really that ottawa arizona got off to slow starts at the beginnings of each half friends had a steady pace the entire game and time of possession that statistic comes up again uh had the ball for 35 minutes and four seconds um yeah. making that almost a 10 minute split so yeah, right with you there. And we had a clip post game here from KAKE um, with Kevante and Demarius, a couple of the guys over at that uh, that friend squad that we'll take a look at. It's actually pretty exciting. We have like a lot of team chemistry, so that's what got us this win today. Um, with us being like together as a whole, playing like that every drive, I don't see who can stop us. It's everything. Uh, I've been here one and nine. It was. It was bad, you know, well, and yeah, um, Coach Karras just came around here and turned the thing around, and now it's a beautiful thing. It's actually pretty exciting. We have, like, a lot of teams. And he talked about it there at the end, kind of the turnaround, right, of this program and, and where it was at compared to where it is right now. And this is a squad that has all the confidence in the world and feels like they could really contend for a championship right now. Absolutely. And Cavante Baker, the guy, the main guy in that clip, like 22 attempts, 179 yards, 8.1 yards per carry. Mm -hmm. Definitely a guy that has put this program on his back to some extent, um, has just had a terrific season, showed out in this playoff game, and also Elias Pino behind him with uh, six carries for a casual 115 yards. Yeah, that's absurd. Um, Kevante Baker, obviously the workforce having a great day, but man, 19.2 yards per carry. That's uh that's not a bad stat to have if you're the RB2 in this offense. So <laughs> no, that feels pretty good. And uh, you know, friends did have a touchdown through the air. Funny enough, it did not come off the hands of Baker, but <laughs> did have it nonetheless. And uh four touchdowns through the air of uh Ottawa, not enough to keep them going here, but we'll keep things moving. Let's talk about a St. Francis team down in Indiana. We've talked a decent amount about, had their quarterback on just a few weeks ago at Southwestern, the mound builders. Hell of a name. You go from friends university. Now they're playing the mound. I mean, there's just great names across NAI football. Um, Southwestern Mm -hmm. pretty, pretty cut and dry, but mound builders is a sick one. Anyways, without belaboring the point, 31-24 Southwestern takes this one. A pretty statement win for them, I think, and a team that has been, at least looking at kind of their schedule and some of their opponents, has not necessarily played up to the level of maybe the better opponents on their schedule throughout the course of the year, but it feels like this time that they got it right and and won this one. This Mound Builders team has uh, had a terrific end of their season going into the playoffs, looked really hot, had a great back half of the year, and they showed it in this playoff game. Now, I will say, this was a bit scary for them. Looks like they had this game completely under control going into halftime. They were up 24 to 10. St. Francis in the second half stormed back to tie it up at 24 mm-hmm. with a minute 50 left in Southwestern College with their only points of the second half in the final two minutes of the game. You drive 51 or 71 yards, excuse yeah. me, to score a 30, uh, the game winning touchdown on a 34 yard pass. So clutching up. Uh, is putting it lightly 
especially with how St. Francis came out to play in the second half. That defense uh, had found their answers to Southwestern's offense that had so much success in the first half. Yeah. But ultimately, Southwestern gets it done. And I think we need to we need to give a shout out to Brain Howell because uh, absolutely terrific came from him. 14 for 28 for 200 yards and four touchdowns. And also USF Indiana's quarterback, Grant, 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 oh my goodness, this is a tough one. Grant Gremmel, try saying that one five times fast. Yep. Uh, 22 for 43, 192 yards and two touchdowns. Pretty good quarterback duel uh, for what we've seen in the playoffs. So uh, just got to shout those two guys out because it was it was a fun one. Yeah, especially since we haven't seen, he hasn't been the guy under center for, you know, the entire season. We talked about Ed Kolk on the show uh, just a few weeks ago. So that's something where, you know, come in, next guy up, and, and you make some things happen, make some plays, and certainly able to do that just a little bit short. Now, round two matchups, I'll just get your quick thoughts on these as we kind of skim through them. The first one, Pikeville, they obviously made some magic happen this weekend. Can they do it again at number one Kaiser? Yeah. Um, this they is, can. This- they can. This feels kind of mean. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, good job in the first round. Now you get the number one team of the country. Yeah, but let's man, see what you do. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a Pikeville team that, like I said, they have nothing to lose. Kaiser has everything to lose. They're the defending national champions. Like, they haven't played a game in the playoff yet. They might be, you know, a couple weeks off. Might not be serving them that well. So we'll see. Ultimately, I think Kaiser will probably take this one. But uh, Pikeville definitely have a case to make. It's important to note, too, with the playoffs when they reseed here. You kind of notice if you look at the seeding numbers, 20 versus 1, 16 versus 2, 15 versus 3. It's kind of yep. all over the place. That's because it's regionally based. So they reseed based on travel. They reseed based on location and that sort of thing, especially because yeah. there are uh, a lot fewer college football teams in the NAI as opposed to a D2 or a D3. Of course. So um, keep that in mind when all these numbers seem out of order. <laughs> Yep, no, it makes a lot of sense. And how about the Falcons from Friends going on and taking on the Vikings from Grandview? Yeah, this is going to be a really fun, gritty matchup. I'm curious to see how Grandview's defense holds up against the triple option because Friends has has got this thing to a T. But I will admit that Ottawa, Arizona defensively, um, not quite on the same level as Grandview is. They're obviously known for playing top two defense in the entire country for like the past five years. So yep. um, a bit of a different test. I'm excited to see what friends can do, but uh, it's grand views to lose. Sticking in the KCAC Southwestern going to Indiana Wesleyan. Yeah. Got some, got some cat fighting going on here. The mound builders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently that that's a cat. So we're just going to roll <laughs> with that. Uh, that's according to their logos and branding. Yes. So we're going to roll with that. Um, take it on the Indiana Wesley Wildcats who have looked really, really good this year. I'm excited to see Southwestern also with a win under their belt and kind of nothing to lose here against an Indiana Wesley team that has been dominating the majority of their schedule um, and how Southwestern measures up against a team that hasn't really been on the back foot at all this year. Mm-hmm. So um, excited to see what Indiana Wesley is going to come out with in this game. Uh, but man, Southwestern, they could get it done. Now a team that's, I think, quite a bit more battle-tested in Montana Western. They're playing host to Dickinson State, and you talk about Indiana Wesleyan. Not, not they haven't been tested. They've beat some really quality opponents, but to your point, they've done it handily. They have not really been uh, shocked in any kind of way in that sort. Montana Western has been in the dirt in a lot of these games and found gritty ways to win a lot of them. Can they do the same against that Blue Hawk squad? Yeah, I think so. This is interesting because next year this is going to be a conference matchup. Uh, yes, which will very be true. Extremely, extremely that. interesting. Yeah, these these foes definitely aren't super familiar with each other, but they will be after yeah, <laughs> this yet. weekend and going forward. So I'm um, excited to see that little preview of the future frontier. But yeah, Montana Western, their high powered offense. I it feel like it outpaces what Dickinson State's got going on, but mm-hmm. they know how to play possession ball, man. You saw it in their playoff game against. Kansas Wesley and Dickinson State kind of knows how to play in the dirt as well uh, and get kind of play that gross brand of football um, that kind of drags teams down with it. So will Montana Western get caught in the mud? I don't know. They're they're in the frontier. <laughs> they're kind of used to this crap, but uh, we will only tell on Saturday. Yeah. And then a battle of two teams that both are represented, both their respective head coaches, winning regional coach of the year honors from the AFCA, which is kind of a a neat little deal. You got Mid-America Nazarene going to Morningside. Yep. Should be a lot of points scored in this game. Yeah. Uh, Both quarterbacks, very high clip passers, uh, very efficient passers. 
And uh, I think with the momentum that Morgan Sites built, they're kind of feeling back in their usual groove, albeit not at one, two, or three like they're used to, but being in the top six and pretty handily uh, being in that top six, which they've proven throughout the back half of their season. They, uh, they're in good shape here. I like the Mustangs, but Mid-American Nazarene, they have put up a lot of points on a lot of teams. Fair enough. And then you go Northwestern, going to Butte, taking on the Ore Diggers from Montana Tech. This Montana Tech squad has been uh, – there's a lot of dreams that have gone to die in Butte, and I guess I'm curious to see if the Red Raiders are next on the list. Yeah, and look, I, I've already had my gripes about Northwestern getting a first run by, like yeah. we talked about in the initial playoff episode. This will be a fantastic test for them because Montana Tech is playing some of their best football right now. Extremely hostile environment to play in. And honestly, Northwestern hasn't dealt with something like this besides their morning side games in recent yep. years. Um, so I'm curious to see how they do, especially on the road and on the road, like not in Iowa. Yep. <laughs> so I would say this um, is not going to be a, a case of the Dort where it's a yes. three nothing ball game. Like you're going to, yes, your defense is going to have to step up, but you're going to need a little bit more offensive production to pull out this one on the road. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a tough one, but this will, I am excited for this game. It's going to tell us a lot about both these teams. Absolutely. Then you've got uh, Georgetown, the Tigers. They'll be at St. Thomas down in Florida. This is one I'm super excited for. Obviously, in proximity, these teams are somewhat close to each other. Yep. You can imagine they've been keeping tabs on each other all season because, you know, the presumption is they might face each other in the playoffs, and here we are. St. Thomas, the only team that's really been able to best them in the past couple of seasons has been Kaiser. Kaiser, right. And yep. not even by that much. Nope. Uh, so St. Thomas is looking in really good shape with Georgetown. They have also gritted out a couple tough games, playing their best football at the end of the season. Excited to see what they can do on the road here. Finally, Benedictine at Texas Wesleyan got a new man in charge of that Texas Wesleyan squad in Sherrod, I believe. And um, he's got them rowing in the right direction it feels like can they keep this thing going at home yeah i really i feel like they can this texas wesley team has looked fantastic all year i've been singing their praises they've been receiving top five votes for me pretty much the whole season that i've been doing the media poll so uh it's it's gonna be a very fun test for them this benedictine team is also a bit battle tested getting a big yes, win early against boarding side um and dropping a couple along the way but nothing too crazy for them so uh, this one's going to be an absolute dogfight, and I think this will probably be the closest out of all of these. <laughs> I like that. I like that pick. We got to start putting. We could do like some hypothetical spreads or something. Would be a fun yeah. deal. I get in the get, really get in the weeds with it. Mm -hmm. I like Absolutely. that. But thank you for the quick turnaround, my man. I appreciate you uh, making this happen, and I'm excited to hopefully I'll be able to tap into some more of these NII games this weekend. Yeah, hopefully, dude. The accessibility is uh, definitely lacking but we'll get there. <laughs> that is the the one like really good plus side of like a D2 and D3 stuff. It's like, okay, I just got my ESPN plus. I watch everything like boom. It's all right there. And as a fan of just small school football, that's a really good upside. I will say. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. AI isn't quite there yet with that. So yeah. And there's, there's positives and negatives to it, but thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate you, dude. Yeah. I'll see you, man.